The difference of many of us, we don't use our faith. Your faith grows. And unless you begin to apply your faith, let me give you an example. The first time I got saved, <clears throat> I would give five pounds. And remember, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, right? So I give five pound, and my thinking couldn't go beyond five pound. But I remember the time God challenged me to write a check for 100 pounds. Today, for me, 100 pound is not a lot of money. Back then it was. But the moment I wrote it, I stopped seeing five pounds as a large amount. Why? Because my thinking, my faith had grown. Then I went from five, from a hundred to a thousand pounds. When I wrote a check for a thousand, the first check I ever wrote for a thousand pounds, I thought Jesus was coming back soon. It was like, oh my God, <clears throat> one thousand pounds, one thousand pounds. For me, it was like, it was like lottery winnings is massive money. And I wrote that check. And you know what? When I wrote the check, my faith grew. And my, I began to think, now fives was tips for the waiters. It was no longer an offering for God. It was tips for waiters when I go to the restaurant. So my thinking began to change. And the figures I could think of now is way beyond. Five pounds is nothing now. But my faith began to grow as I began to give more and more. As I began to trust God with my wife's healing, my children's healing, as I saw God heal my family, I began to trust God that I can believe God for anything now. I am a place right now where I believe I'm rock solid with God. That no matter what comes into my life, I understand my faith is so developed, not just in one area. Some of you develop your faith in, in, in uh, salvation. I'm saved, glory to God, I'm going to heaven. And that's as far as you go. You don't, for healing, some of you got healed, but you don't develop your faith. Sometimes what you have to do is not wait for circumstances to come to you, but go to it. In other words, this headache, no, I'm not going to take any medication for this. I'm going to walk this through. And God, I, the first time I sat down, I, I, had, I used to get bad migraines and I laid down. And I said, God, I'm not taking any more tablets. I, for three days and three nights, I was in my room. The pain was intense. I laid there, I laid there and I closed my eyes. I slept off most of it. And when I woke up on the third day, I've never had a headache again. I faced it. You know what? I, I went to it and I challenged that thing. My faith grew. When I came out that room, my faith grew. <clears throat> Are you with me? So whilst you're living according to your own strength and abilities, some of you, if God never done another thing for you, you wouldn't know the difference. Because you're leaning on your own understanding. You're trusting in your own abilities. Every one of us should be looking for opportunities to trust God. Listen to the voice of God. I would, test, I would do things like, Lord, <clears throat> because we do things where we want to hear God when it's things for us. But if you want to hear the voice of God and train yourself to hear the voice of God, <clears throat> you've got to tell him to speak to you to do things you don't want to do. Because then you know it's God. Are you with me? So I would say, Lord, is there anyone in this building today that needs money? Let me be the one to bless them. And you walk around and sometimes you just see someone and it's just like a light. It's like a light, and you go and give it to them, and they go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, thank you. How, how did you know? And you, oh, thank you, Jesus, I got you. And how many after you do it a few times, you understand the voice of God? It's not just the, the audible voice. It's not, it's sometimes it's the weakness in your spirit. It, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. How do you learn to be led? By faith. Because sometimes it'll take you where you don't want to go. And when you want to hear the voice of God, ask him to tell you to do the things you don't want to do. Because when you hear him tell you, you know it's God. Amen? How I many you know if, if, if you say to me, God just told you to come and get an audio a video, a CD, that you, want the, you want the CD, right? How I many you know if he told you to give the person next to you 20 pounds, you may not want to do that. You start saying, I bind you, Satan, get thee, <clears throat> get thee behind me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind you. But watch this, Hebrews 6 um, he was 11, 6, did I say? He says this. But, but without faith, <clears throat> it's impossible to please God. I want you to understand that. That these are the things that attract the presence of God. <clears throat> without faith, we cannot please God. Without faith... We cannot please God. Without faith, we cannot please God. 
Without faith, we cannot please God. <clears throat> if I ask you today, what are you standing in faith for? What faith walk are you on today? Where are you in your walk where God is, is the one you're relying on completely? Where are you now <clears throat> with God in your faith? Are you, are you one of those that before you do anything, listen to me, I don't do nothing, I do nothing until I hear from God. And I'm not talking about the way some of you hear from God. I'm talking about I, when I say I hear from God, you could put my neck on the guillotine and cut it off, I'll still tell you God said. When you say you heard from God, are you willing to put your life on it to say God spoke? When we were moving from, Milton to, from Croydon to Milton Keynes, we would not move until we heard from God. We, stood, we, we prayed, we fasted, we prayed, we fasted, and it was when I said to my wife, I came out after locking myself in my room for weeks and weeks and weeks, praying and seeking God, and a scripture came off the Bible right in front of my face like that, and says, prepare your baggage for moving. I said, God has spoken. When we went to Milton Keynes, we, we, we moved into our house, and I knew when I saw it, it was God. I can guarantee you, when we moved to America, I guarantee it was God. When I came back here, I knew it was God. I could bank my life on it because I learned to hear the voice of God. But there's still an element of faith. Because not everything you're going to do, you're going to understand. It's not everything. Sometimes you have to step out. And as you step out, listen, our building, which, we, which is running very nicely. I'm giving you some figures in a minute that make you, I'm building your faith up so you don't collapse when I show it to you. If we, remember when I said to you, if we stayed here, nothing will happen? <clears throat> when did it change? We gave notice with nothing in the future. It was only when those four lepers said, if we stay here, we perish. So let's go down there. And when they went to the Philistine camp, <clears throat> God had already gone before them and prepared the way. Listen to me, when Peter was in the boat at, at the fourth watch of the night when it was dark and he saw Jesus come in the water and he says, Lord, if it, you, if it be you, bid me come. Peter had to, it wasn't just Lord, bid me come. Peter had to do something. When you're in the boat, <coughs> you've got to step out of the boat. Have you ever walked on water? Huh? Have you ever swam? When you get out of boat, a boat in a storm, have you ever swam in a storm? You ever swam in a storm? Why not? <laughs> Wisdom, right? When Peter gets out the boat, there is, watch what happens here. You step out the boat, Jesus is over there. Lord, if it be you, bid me come. Okay, come. What next? That you say things like, Lord, if it you be you, Bid me come. Come. Do you ever say things that you don't think about? Because what does the come involve? I'm going to get out. And how many you know, like when I first started going swimming, you hold on. Especially when it's a deep end. But a deep end of a pool is not, nothing compared to the ocean, right? So here you are, you've got to, you're stepping out. And at some point, you've got to let go and let God. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? There must be a point where you let go and you let God. And some of you are holding on to stuff and people and you will not let go. You hold on to children. Let me tell you, I learned a long time ago from the prodigal son's father that your children will eventually grow up and they may leave home. You've got to let them go. If that man had held on to that child, it would not have been the same outcome as what he saw. There's some things you're going through, relationships or debts or bills or whatever. I'm not saying ignore your bills, but there must be a time when you let go of your worry. You let go of your anxiety and you let God. And it wasn't until Peter had completely let go of the boat, because while you're still holding on to the wood, God will not show up for you. It's only when you let go completely that God showed up. And Peter's walking toward God. And as usual, when God delivers you, when God gives you a breakthrough, when God gives you a miracle, 
The devil comes along to steal your, your miracle. And what happens, the circumstances change. That's why you cannot live by circumstance. If you go by your circumstances, you'll always live defeated. Because what looks bad eventually could turn out as a blessing. What looks bad is where God's going to turn it around for you. And as he walks towards Jesus, he says he panicked because he saw the waves. While his eyes was on Jesus, he could walk on stormy waters. The moment he began to sink, Jesus was right there, just pulled him up, say, what are you afraid of? I'm here. And I'm saying to you all today, what are you afraid of? Is Jesus not in the midst of your life? Is he not your Lord and your King? If he so freely gave his son, what do you think you're going through that he will not help you with? Come on, tell me. What do you think, if he would give his son on Calvary, if he so freely gave his son, if he counts the hair on your head, if he does all of those things, why do you think that you're on your own going through what you're going through? Why do you think he will leave you? If as a father, if I could help my children, I would. But there's some things I'm not gonna help them with. There's some things they need to go through because they need to learn and grow. And that's what the Father God will do. There's some things he'll allow us to go through because how many you know that it's only when we go through some tough times we, be, we mature in God. You watch the ones who've been through tough times, they're not as quick to criticize as the ones who've not been through. The ones who've not been through, always the quick ones say, yeah, if I were me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, don't worry, Baba, it's coming to you. You can, you can judge it, but you know what? Everybody's gonna go through. Can you say amen? Let me give you one more scripture. I, I'm, oh, I've got 16 minutes and I'm going to finish up. Go to Matthew chapter 8 quickly. We may continue next week or Wednesday night. Matthew <clears throat> chapter 8. <clears throat> Say amen when you're there. Verse 5 says, And when Jesus... When Jesus entered into Capernaum, they came unto him, a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, <clears throat> grievously tormented. Jesus said unto him, I will come to your house and I will heal him. I'll come and I'll heal him. Now, watch this. I want to pay attention to this. Who is Jesus in these days? <clears throat> in, in these days, he is the most... Famous man ever, right? Wherever he goes in Mark chapter one, he says that the whole city came to his door. You read other scriptures where he had to get on the boat because people thronged him. They followed him everywhere he went. If Jesus came to your house, expect five or 10,000 people to be behind him. Wherever he went, people followed. Jesus says to the centurion, my servant is sick, I'll come and heal him. Now, what does this mean? Jesus is say, saying, I'm going to come to your house. How many of you, if Jesus came to your house, would still be thinking about your servant? Would you not want Jesus to come to your house? Everyone's going to know Jesus comes to your house, right? Jesus comes to your house. Some of you, I come to your house and you prepare all this stuff. It's like, I can't eat like that. You, you go out, you clean the house because the pastor's coming to visit you. Uh, you, uh, every time I come to your house, it's usually very tidy. Is it like that all the time? Everything's in place and everything, the children are sitting down all tidied up. And <clears throat> but how many know if Jesus is coming to your house, that's a major deal. Number one, it's going to put me as the man in my city. Because who, did Jesus come to your house? Oh, no, okay, he came to my house. <laughs> I don't know why. <clears throat> it's a status, right? That Jesus is going to come to my house. He's going to man, going to come into my house. And everyone following you, and you, you have the right. So there's a way outside. Jesus, please come in. We were in, we were in South Africa a few years ago, and Nelson Mandela came. And we're all in the lounge, and Nelson Mandela came in. I mean, Nelson Mandela, oh my gosh. He came with security, the security on the roof, the security, the helicopters. And he came into the lounge, and we're all in the lounge. And I'm like, hey, this is a good time. We're running for photographs, Nelson Mandela. Because how many you know you want to be seen? Yes. Especially now. 
We're trying to get photographed. And the pastor's wife goes, everyone out, everyone out, 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 out. Uh, <clears throat> push us all out the room. And her photograph with Mr. Mandela. Imagine Jesus coming to your house. She, he came to the church. And I'm, then I'm sitting behind him. I'm, st I'm standing behind Mr. Mandel, right behind his neck back. I could, see, I could see the hairs on his neck. And I reached for a chewing gum and the, his security went like this. I don't fancy no gum yet, sir. But I'm sitting there, Mr. Mandela, you just want to stroke the back. Yeah, Mr. Mandela. Imagine Jesus coming to your house. Imagine if that, what that woman would have done. It was Jesus. She threw us all out the lounge so she could have Mr. Mandela to herself. But he did sign the book and give it to me. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I've still got photographs trying to, like, you know, you know when you stand behind him, you're trying to get like you look standing next to him? Hmm. Jesus coming into your house, right? And watch this. The centurion says, this is, this is amazing. He says, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come to my, under my roof. How many would say that? Be honest. How many say, you're, I'm not worthy? You say, maybe worthy. Come, come, come. <laughs> you would want him to come regardless, right? But watch what faith does. Faith is not starstruck. And a lot of Christians today are starstruck. I watch, you know, Elisha, Elisha preaches, I've, I listen to her preaching. I've been doing this for 30 odd years and there's no speaker we've ever had in this house that can preach a better message than what she preaches. None. <clears throat> what she preaches is sound, it's scriptural, it's edifying, it's anointed and it has the power to change your life. In all the years I've heard, I've not heard one speaker I could say uh, that she can't do like that. What I heard, she has the anointing to do everything that any guest speaker has ever, ever had. But some don't come out because she's not so-and-so. And as long as you think like that, you would, you would have been the one to say, Jesus, come to my house. Watch what this man says. He says, the centurion's answer said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under, under authority and have, having soldiers under me, I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he watched this, four things that attract the presence of God. When Jesus heard this, he, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say to you, I've not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. He marveled. <clears throat> you don't have to ask whether the servant got healed or not. Now, when we talk about faith, how about you and I? What are we standing on? Where's our faith? I'm in a place right now where only God can help us. It, you, you could try, but ultimately, it's God. We've made commitments that only God can get us through. And that's just the beginning. We're going to go past that stage and we're going to go bigger than that. And after that, we're going to go bigger than that. But in your personal life, your life should be one of praise. Your life should be one of worship. Your life should be one of faith. And your life should be one of sacrifice. When I say to you, what sacrifice have you made this year? What sacrifice have you made for the kingdom? What sacrifice have you made? I remember when um, it was Morris Cirillo. Years ago when he was, uh, Jim Baker had lost the ministry and they were breaking up the ministry. And Morris Sorolla sent out an, an, a, a, not a, a letter and said he wanted to buy the satellite dish because the Koreans wanted it. And he says the, the world should not get this. You know, we emptied our accounts to send for that. What? We didn't even know where the satellite was. We didn't even know what it involved. But all we knew was the world will not get it. And I look around and I see, uh, even listening to the CD you're going to listen to, where they get, in, in Nigeria, they have a Christian organization 
and the whole of the churches in Nigeria could only put together 1.25 million naira. Naira. 1.25 million naira to help combat or fight or preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the, one of the Nigerian governments reached into the Nigerian accounts and gave $21 billion to Islam to convert Nigeria to an Islamic nation. And the church is not thinking that way. Right now, terrorists are funding money, funding money to promote Islam, to, to build mosques, to take over the nations of the world. Don't, don't think it's just Syria or Afghanistan or, or any of those places. Don't think it's restricted to the north in Nigeria because one day Boko Haram is coming right down into Lagos. And you know why? Because the Christians are so busy doing other things. Other things rather than building the kingdom. Our mind is not kingdom minded. Our mind is on our own devices. It's on our own stuff, not realizing if we don't wake up as a body, I'm not talking about V2V church, I'm talking about every church in the world, if we don't wake up and begin to band together and begin to build establishments, isn't it funny, you can go to Regent's Park, there's a mosque, you can go all over London, have you noticed there's more and more coming up all over, even out here on the high street, in a residential area. They've put a mosque. You know why? Because the, the, the Islamic people have infiltrated the governments. They're now, it, you listen to that tape again, and you'll find in Nigeria, all the major departments are, are, are Muslims in there. In this nation, it's the same thing happening. And if the church doesn't wake up, soon it'll be hard to get planning to even have services. Because their idea is to kill everyone that's not a Muslim. We need to wake up and recognize this gospel must be preached. And it's, it means sacrifice of time, sacrifice of, of, we have prayer. It can't get much easier that you pray at home. It, it don't get much easier than that. What else can we do? We've taken it to your door. And some of you got the text on, on Friday night, but you still kept playing your candy crush. Are you with me? You got the text, right? You should, let me see your hand, you got the text. And what did you do? Can everyone say that? You speak for yourself. Fifi, how many, or Paul, how many was on the, online on Friday night? 79. Was it 79? Huh? Check now, and please give us the figure. We have, we record you. Tell us, Fifi, Paul. 79 of us came to prayer on Friday night in our living room. How many checked your Facebook on Friday? How many checked your Facebook? Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how, <clears throat> isn't it funny how we can do things like that for hours and never get tired? Posting a lot of nonsense. Just put out a lot of rubbish that has no, nothing to do with life or godliness. Just put up nonsense, people doing stupidness, pouring water on their head. <laughs> My first question is how many of them actually gave to the charity? Give what? It's, 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 a, it's a selfish, self-centered, self-promoting spirit. You're pouring water. <laughs> if I had it, I would, if I had my way, I'd go around to every one of them and pour concrete instead and you just freeze up like that and say, when you accept Jesus, I'll let you out. What a lot of nonsense, pouring ice on your head. For what? And then some now trying to do, bounce off of that and do something else. Ice bucket challenge. Isn't it funny how we can do that? We ice bucket each other. I, I, I nominate Danny and I nominate Eddie. Huh? <clears throat> we talk longer than we pour the water and I nominate. You're supposed to nominate three, but you're going to 25. <clears throat> and we talk because we want to be heard. And then, and then we take the bucket and we, 
we're poor, and we do all that. And not one will come on and say, repent of your sins. Jesus Christ loves you. He went to the cross for you. Do the gospel challenge. Get on your Facebook. <clears throat> Get up there and start, everybody start saying, I challenge you to tell three people that Jesus Christ is Lord. I challenge you to get up there and do the gospel challenge. <clears throat> Let everybody know that Jesus loves you. We won't do that because if we do that, our friends will go, hey, that's a Christian? You mean them persons that swear and cuss and smoke and drink, drink ganja tea and go rave? That's that Christian? Because some can't do that because <clears throat> it will kill our, our social life. Because you know how you live. So let's start the gospel challenge. Huh? Here's the gospel challenge. Open your Bible. This is the gospel challenge, not the ice bucket. Open your Bible and preach a 60 seconds, a 30 second sermon and tell them why you must be born again. Why Jesus Christ loves you. Why Jesus Christ died for you. And what's, what's going to happen to you if you don't accept him? I saw something this morning where in Palestine they went fishing and they, they caught all these fish that's never been seen before. And they said, praise Allah. Praise Allah. I'm going to go as soon as I finish. I'm going to put Jesus is the, the provider of all fishes. <laughs> They're the one that said Allah never created nothing. They said Jesus spoke at two days old. They said Jesus took clay and created a bird and it flew. That means Jesus is the creator and Allah don't create nothing. Buddha don't create, uh, not Buddha. Muhammad, they said Jesus coming back, but Muhammad isn't. So Jesus must be Lord, right? So we're gonna go on their, on their Facebook, get ready for some cussing because they cuss me all the time <clears throat> when I put it up there. Stand to your feet with me.